today we're talking about Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, which according to Aristotle is the great example of tragedy, certainly in the ancient world when Aristotle was writing. Oedipus Rex tells the story of a man's self-discovery, and in that self-discovery uh, he comes to the realisation that he has in fact done something terrible. He has murdered his own father and married his own mother. And those events have happened before the, the play begins. So the play, in a sense, uh, isn't so much showing us those events as it is showing us Oedipus as he comes to the realisation of what he has done and who he is. And the play opens with uh, the city of Thebes where Oedipus is king in a period of, of turmoil. Uh, death in the fruitful flowering of her soil, death in the pastures, death in the womb of woman and pestilence, a fiery demon gripping the city. Now I'm joined by Laurel Moffat and Colin Dre and we're going to uh, delve into to this text and I want to begin after that introduction by going right to the end of the play, uh, to the very last lines, where the chorus declares, none can be called happy until that day when he carries his happiness down to the grave in peace. So let's begin there and ask, why do you think <laughs> the play leads to that conclusion? None can be called happy, essentially, until the day he dies. So you mean, how does the play proceed from death and destruction and burning demons everywhere to we only get some rest when we're dead. That's right. That, that, that trajectory of joy. Um, mm. I, I think for me, as you were talking about, it, it's really about a man's self-discovery of his place in the universe and his experience. Uh, the this fuller picture of his own existence, life. And in that sense, it's also a representation of all mankind's search to understand its place within the universe. And so <laughs> even though there is a, a rather grim overview, that uh, a worldview that this play carries with it, that doesn't really alter. I mean, it is, you know, it begins in darkness, ends in darkness, becomes a literal darkness in Oedipus stabbing his own eyes out with the revelation of his circumstance. But it's in that coming to understand himself that there is a sense of, of hope, of, of mm. having, having a capacity to pursue the unknown, to actually seek to understand one's place in the universe. And there's this whole push and pull of the characters in the play, some praising ignorance. Ignorance is bliss and you don't want to seek for the answers, but Oedipus doggedly pursues the answers, some, sometimes pig-headedly, stupidly, um, but ultimately that revelation allows his sacrifice and his understanding of himself to free the people. So even though they're still in darkness, they have a capacity to grow and shed that curse. And that was a very long no, rambling so, answer yeah. too. I was, my translation's a bit different. Yeah. And um, the line at the end is now as we keep our watch and wait the final day, count no man happy till he dies, free of pain at last. And that use of no man instead of none mm. then opens, I think, the door to that, um, the idea of becoming nothing, mm. where um, the humility of it. Um, but it, uh, in my ears, it echoes, or at least Shakespeare, I think, would echo with Richard II, I know no I. You know, he becomes nothing. Mm, yeah. He's nobody. Um, so it's so fascinating, because I think there's this double meaning there at the end, where yeah. it, we begin with the plague, we end with this desolation of realizing that you are the murderer, you are the one who's married, the one. you've fulfilled this horrible, horrible prophecy mm. Oedipus has in himself in his pursuit for the truth, realizing, mm. coming to this realization. But yet that recognition um, of himself and lowering himself, he is no longer this mm. all-powerful king. Yeah. yeah, He's become nothing. That's interesting because there is a point where uh, his wife slash mother 
um, Yocasta. Um, so you're going with Yocasta? Yeah, okay. it's, there's a different name in, um, in Homer. Okay. She's given a different name in Homer, but... Um, I just mean Jocasta. Oh, Jocasta, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, either, either. And she says, um, you know, stop, stop pursuing this. Mm. You, you know, um, you don't need to. And he assumes that it's because she's ashamed yeah. of the idea that he might be lowly born That's rather right. than aristocratic. Like maybe he's just a shepherd's son. That's right. And maybe he's yeah. just a shepherd's yeah, my, son. My shame will not fall upon you. Yeah. And nonetheless, yeah. he says, you know, even if that turns out to be true, I'll, I'll live with that. You know, I'll live with being of humble origin, yeah. not realising, of course, at that point, what she knows, mm. um, that uh, if all these other things are true, then it's also true that she is his mother. Mm. Um, so, but, so that raises that question of humility yes. that you mentioned, that he's so reduced to nothing. He's reduced to nothing, but is it in that that you could have happiness? You know, as in, yeah. is it just a bleak curse that there is no happiness mm. until you, and then death is the relief. Or is, is it that relief. if you have nothing, you're happy? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Which are is you, very different. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, are you, are you arguing, um, and I'm not saying, uh, just to get my, my head around it, yeah. I apologise for not, <laughs> for not uh, disentangling this, but are you saying that his entire life he's kind of uh, sought to evade this fate that's been placed upon him and in thinking that he might do it, he has got a sort of sense of humility or pride, certainly that your caster represents. I mean, she's the manifestation of that. I beat fate, and you can you can get around. What is a, a fig to divination? I think is that yeah. word. Um, so he he's kind of tainted by that, and in realizing that he is just a pawn of a cruel universe, there's a kind of freedom, a lowering of himself to that. Or am I miss? I don't know if I'd gone that far. Okay. I only was well, thinking, of, as in, I hadn't thought through the whole implication of the fate idea. Right. But there is, I guess, there is that notion. Um, well, the whole my, fate free will thing is probably a big yeah, door to open at this yeah, point. Yeah, so. that's right. That, yeah. um, yes, do you have will? I mean, yeah, the idea, do you have, do you have the will? will? Do you have this free will? Or mm. is it all determined yeah. for you? What I guess I was thinking is that he pursues the truth at any cost, right? He pursues yes. the truth. There's and a nobility in that. Yeah, it's and phenomenal. he, he yeah. keeps going when everyone's saying, stop, turn back. <laughs> Teresius, like yeah. the, the yeah. main purveyor the of prophet. knowledge, yeah. Yeah. And is saying, stop, dude. Like, yeah. yeah, and there's this huge risk that others know to the pursuit of truth. Yeah. Um, and he even has outrage when there's the hint that, you know, with... Um, Creel? Yes, Creon coming back and he's like, out, there's some outrage there, yeah. um, but yet he keeps going. Yeah. And then when he finally, I guess I was just thinking when he finally have the realization, the recognition mm. that he's at, he's the bottom, yeah. you know, he is at the bottom, like any kind of culture, anywhere, anytime, like those are the two things yeah. that are like unspeakable acts, yeah. right? Yes. And then he is the fulfillment of both of those. Yeah. And then to come to that realization where he can't go any lower. Yes. I guess I was thinking like, yeah. is that when you can have right. some relief when you're like, they're actually, I've reached bottom. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the only so way there's is comfort, up. There's comfort in um, this sense of your own place in the yeah. universe, which is nothing. Yes. Right, in this play. Yeah. Um, but it does, coming back, because I think these ideas tie together. You mentioned um, there's a, a kind of argument going on through the play between fate or chance. And Jocasta, uh, you know, as you say, she says everything is chance. Mm. And she actually sort of, for evidence of that, she says, for example, yes. <laughs> oh man, you know, to show you that the universe is just made up of random events and that prophecy is meaningless, she gives the example of how um, she and her um, husband, Laius, the, the previous king, had received the prophecy that their son would grow up to kill Laius and marry Jocasta. And so she's telling Oedipus all of this as, uh, to comfort him. Uh, that prophecy can't be relied on because, you know, they took their son away mm. to be killed. They gave him to a shepherd away to be killed. And, you know, Laius was killed by a random, um, you know, robber on the street. And uh, she's never married <laughs> her son. So obviously prophecy is meaningless. Yeah. Uh, and this in a way is her hubris, isn't it? Mm. Um, 
the opposite of humility. You know, she thinks that basically um, the the will of the gods or the will of fate, which in this play is above the gods, um, that it uh, is basically pointless and that everything is just random chance. And Oedipus himself, however, acts in a different way. He he basically sends Creon to find out mm -hmm. from you know the um, the oracle at Delphi. Uh, what's going on? Why is Thebes experiencing this pestilence? And, um, and he also consults with, with Tiresias. Uh, and yet he, even though we're saying he pursues the truth relentlessly, when he is confronted with it initially by Creon, and only partially, he's never told the full mm. implication. You know, initially it's just he's the killer of Laius. Um, Tiresias, however, says this day brings you your birth and your death, mm. you know. Mm. But in any case, he, he pursues it through Creon and Tiresias. But nonetheless, he when, as you say, Laura, when he's um, confronted with the, the revelation by Creon and Tiresias, he um, condemns them. Mm. So initially, he doesn't accept their testimony. Mm. Um, yeah, in fact, you know, Creon's like, what do you want? You want me banished? Yeah. No, I want you dead. Mm. Like, yeah. He's like, <laughs> yeah. I want to erase you. Yeah. Um, and he's brought that on himself. Oedipus says, you know, we have to find this killer of Laius and um, he has to be, um, anyone who's, you know, he has to be condemned, has to be killed or mm. sent into exile, mm. excommunicated as it were, so that the, the, the people of Thebes can, can be restored. Yeah. Oh, you're right, he, he does falter there and I'm going to sort of mm. introduce something that we were talking about before we started yeah. filming. Uh, Oedipus is, is like a detective. He's, yeah. he's the first detective, basically. Uh, and he ingeniously, uh, Sophocles is playing out the, the conventions of detective fiction before this was even mm. a genre. Um, and in, in this case, he's following a red herring for a yeah. moment. Um, because later when he's confronted with new evidence, he doesn't try to suppress it or he, he follows it. He just for a moment thinks, well, this is the most logical conclusion. They have to be you know, in cahoots. There's a conspiracy going yeah. on. Uh, and the language, I'm not sure if it's in the Fagels, but certainly in the Watling that we're using here, brings out all of those detective tropes. There are witnesses, there, mm -hmm. I don't think the word alibi is used, but they edge so close to it. Yeah. There's motive. Yeah. Uh, Creon says, well, why would I do it? I, you know, I have all of the benefits of being a king without actually being the king. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I would doom myself if I did that. Um, there's witness accounts, there's testimonies. It's, it's all of the conventions of... And contested um, evidence. Exactly. You know, how many robbers were yeah, there? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because if there's more than one, it can't be me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because right. I'm only one. That's right. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, so he does, like, even though he is swayed momentarily mm. um, by accusing uh, Tiresias and, and Creon, he's not so uh, fixated on that that he's willing to stitch them up. Like, yeah. when, when the moment... And he listens to his... He's swayed to a certain extent by his people who say, no, 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 this doesn't make sense. Show... Show mercy. He doesn't have him dragged off to be killed immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He does drag him off the stage, but he doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't put him to death, though he'd like to. So, mm -hmm. he's again, he's misconstruing uh, the evidence, but to a certain extent, he is following it as best mm. he could for that moment. What about this idea uh, we've touched upon that uh, there's a nobility in Oedipus pursuing the truth? And I suppose, therefore, um, there's something ignoble about your caster trying to resist this revelation. Um, why does your caster think it's of any benefit not to pursue the truth? I mean, if it's true, um, shouldn't she want to know it? Isn't it do, better to know it? Do you mean in her moment of crisis where the, yeah. the happy messenger is, I, I bring great news. That's and right. And of course he <laughs> dumps the most horrible, horrible revelation yes. yeah. upon them all. I, my reading on that was always just that your caster was, uh, because she was in shock. She's mm. literally, there's a whole page uh, in, again, in our mm. translation where the messenger and Oedipus are, or Oedipus is questioning the messenger and it's becoming horribly apparent what has happened. Um, or is that, sorry, is that the moment with the, uh, the shepherd? Yeah, or well, no, the messenger, both the, mes uh, the messenger is a shepherd, or had been. Yeah. And so the shepherd that took the child That's right. to the, um, 
uh, you know, your custer's messenger takes the child and it ends up being handed over to another shepherd. That's how they. That's how that exchange happens. And that's the second exchange, isn't it? That's after yeah. Yucasta has left the. Yeah. So uh, in that first moment, she's obviously registering what has happened in real time. And there's about a page where she's silent, but yeah. clearly freaking out yeah. over to the side. Um, so I think her initial impulse is don't pursue this, don't go any further. Is she knows she's destroyed. Maybe there's a chance that she could save mm. him, like cling yeah. to that ignorance that even Theresius was yeah. um, proclaiming to be good. Yeah. But obviously, and much to his credit, the, the play and the king uh, seem to determine that no matter how ugly the truth, it's better to, to pursue it, to understand, mm. to know your place in the universe, even, yeah. even if that revelation is oppressive and yeah. destructive. Yeah, there's a huge risk, I think, to this truth that mm. that Oedipus pursues, mm. um, because then you you it requires action, like the action yeah. that was promised at the beginning, which is the punishment for this um, this evil. That's yeah. you know, and the the reason why there's the plague, they say, yeah. um, because of him, because of him at the very heart of the kingdom. Mm. But I would think too, if that his his revelation, like his recognition of what he is, then yeah. of course that the the spill it spills out to who is Yucasta and what has she done without yeah. knowing it as mm. well. So the um, I don't know. It sounds like she could just not want to pursue it because if it's true, mm. then you have to live with that or die. It seems case. like she's already. Uh, maybe I'm misreading, but. I, th I feel like in that moment, she's already decided to die. You think but, so? Mm. I, I think. Mm. I mean, it's, it's difficult to tell because then there's that escalation between her and Oedipus and maybe that pushes her to it. But certainly when she leaves that stage, which mm. is only moments after she realises what's going on, she declares, this is my final word to you. So, mm. see yeah. ya, I'm going to destroy yeah. myself. Yeah. So, as in, she was going to die, even if others never came to the realization. Mm. You think be her own recognition of what's happened, then yeah. that sets off the course of events that ends with her suicide. I think so, because then the the attendant who goes and sees and comes back with that expositional data dump of, this is what I just saw. I know. And off stage, uh, I saw Jocasta sorry, kill herself. I saw Oedipus stab his eyes out. Uh, in, in his account of what she does, she races into the bedroom and starts shouting to the heavens to mm. Laios about yeah. um, their circumstance. And that seems to be her reckoning with a fate that has outwitted her. She thought she beat fate and yeah. you know divination is is a, a fig to divination i'll say again yeah. mm -hmm. uh and it, it, that seems to be the moment where she realizes her place in the universe it's beaten her and she will destroy herself because of it again that's maybe over reading but mm. well i wonder if this isn't if there's a strange opening with with creon talking about good news mm. you know he's got good news that is if good news may come of bad mm. uh but I wonder what that good news is. Um, and it seems to me, on a large scale, it is that fate is real, that the universe, to that extent, is ordered. Mm. And um, that uh, the oracle can be trusted and everything actually fits into place. So good news can come of bad. Um, what is it later in the play that has the power both to please and to grieve, mm. uh, cause grief at the same time as it pleases us, which is also the, the, the play itself, tragedy itself, that pleases us as it causes us pain. You know, the, the idea of, yeah. yeah, which is in Aristotle, the, um, the idea that good comes from suffering. Uh, so that in this sense, even though it's a tragedy, a tragedy of fate, uh, nonetheless, um, a good thing emerges from this, mm. that is, mm. The cause of the curse is discovered and he is removed and presumably Thebes then uh, is, is restored. Yeah. Um, so just a final comment then on that. Can, oh, it's kind of like a diagnosis of an illness, yes. isn't it? As in you can't get better until you kind of get the full extent of the diagnosis. Yeah. And it's once you have yeah. that, then you can, if there is treatment, you can receive it. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, that is... It's a painful place to be, yeah. but sometimes it's like the best place because actually it can lead to health and You're restoration. You're on the way to a solution. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I think so because you're right. In the in the conventions of the plot, Creon turns up going, "I've got a recipe to heal us." You know, yes. the, the gods say, "Find the guy who killed the previous king, and then we'll all be good." Uh, and then as the plot plays out, as you said, mm -hmm. it, it it becomes about an actual uh, uncovering of suffering, which is when we get into the whole question of fate versus free will. He was doomed to do this. How can he be punished for it? Which I think is in in his uncovering of the suffering. Oedipus brings it upon himself, willingly. So it's, it's not just, oh man, my life sucks. There's a bit of that. But uh, it, it's not just simply, my life sucks, the fates have screwed me over. Uh, when he gets to the end and he stabs his eyes out, he, there's this funny exchange where uh, it, the people around him seem to want to give him this opportunity to curse the gods. And they say, why did you do this? Why did you stab? Your eyes out, uh, it's page 62 for us, but the chorus. Those eyes, how could you do what you have done? What evil power has driven you to this end? And of course, they're talking about stabbing out his eyes, not why did you marry your mother, mm. kill your mother. Uh, and he says, Apollo, friends, Apollo has laid this agony upon me, not by his hand, I did it. And this strange, he's, he takes ownership of this action of destroying himself mm. in this moment. Yes, the fates set me up to do this, but I... I accept autonomy and agency for what I've inflicted upon myself. And I, I think that's the purpose of the play is he's put into a circumstance where fate has destroyed him, but he has to accept perhaps an unfair ownership of that, mm -hmm. that suffering. Yeah. That's why he asks for banishment. That's why when Creon says, come back inside, we'll take care of you. He says, no, banish me. Let me sort of take the burden all this suffering and wander off into mm. um, the wilderness. It's his free will comes from accepting, ironically, his place in a fated universe. That's a great point on which to finish, I think. Well. And we'll keep talking off camera. And the <laughs> students will keep talking now in class. Thank you both. Thanks. Thank you. Mm.